，用声音碰撞世界，生动活泼。Hello， 大家好，我是丁教，欢迎收听全新一集《What's Next 科技早知道》。嗨，大家好，我是 Howie 徐浩。大家可能对世界首富贝佐斯的蓝色起源这家公司都不陌生。我的好朋友 Len Bass 就是去年十二月搭乘蓝色起源火箭的六个乘客之一。Len Bass 是我的顾问，也是我之前创建的 TrustPass 的投资人之一。今天是我在虎年的第一期节目，就和 l a m b a s s 这位白手起家的亿万富翁聊聊他太空旅行背后的故事。我们也聊了他的人生观、工作观，希望对我们大家在生活、职场或者创业、投资的态度有所启发。首先，我的确很好奇 l a m b a s s 是怎么衡量这次搭乘火箭背后的风险。毕竟，蓝色起源至今发射。火箭的次数并不那么多。对话中，他有一个让我印象深刻的看法，就是他觉得搭乘火箭要承担的风险和打车坐 Uber 差不多。还有，为什么他带着儿子一起参加那趟太空旅行，使得他俩成为历史上第一对父子宇航员 l a m b a s s 衡量风险的态度也贯穿了他的职业生涯。他之前在 AT&T 等几个大型企业做销售管理。之后，作为 CEO， 在零八年金融危机的背景下，把 Palo Networks 从一家初创公司做到网络安全赛道的头部企业。之后又加盟 Zscaler， 再一次颠覆安全行业。他这一路走来，对于绝大多数人来说，肯定是不断冒险、不断过山车。但他自己对所谓的风险有蛮独特的理解。聊完以后，我其实并不觉得他的这些职场决定是在做冒险，而是扎扎实实的在走每一步。最后，我问到他，现在作为一个亿万富翁，做投资有什么目标时，他说投资为了享受，为了学习，为了帮助下一代企业家。这个我蛮认同的。虽然财务回报仍然应该是一个重要的指标，但是对所有投资人个人来说，享受这个过程很重要。我们今天的话题有不少有趣的内容。搭乘火箭前有哪些必要的训练啦？他这趟太空旅程俯视地球，看到什么？一个不一样的地球有没有改变他的人生观？他又是如何评价贝佐斯的航天事业？当年 Palo Networks 和这一代的 z s c a l e r 走向成功的背后故事？他眼中的早期风投和成长期投资的区别。好了，接下去就是我和 l a n b a s s 的对话。Hey, l a n how are you doing? I am wonderful. It's good to be talking with you again, Howie. So you on your boat? I am、uh, sailing in the、uh, Bahamas, reflecting on life. Okay, speaking of reflecting on life, you just made a big move last December. The Blue Origin, obviously. I'm so proud that I have a friend who actually went to the space. To me, it's a big deal because you know you are only the what Blue Origin's official flight, like the third flight, right? That's correct. And then, so tell me more about it. In particular, I was wondering, right? You know, you are a very accomplished person. You have done a lot of things. You know, you are taking a risk a little bit in some ways. You know, why taking the risk? Well, I think the idea of going to space was something that was in my mind from childhood, and I've always been a bit of a risk taker. You know me both as an entrepreneur, somebody who's、uh, looked to innovate in technology for many years, and so to some degree, taking risk was in my blood, and fulfilling a childhood dream、uh, aligned with the risk taking aspect, and、uh, and that led to my.、Uh, Taking this wonderful adventure, so you're a risk taker. I know that for a long time, but how do you see the risk? Because to me, this is the third time someone you know、um, yes. flew this spaceship. Like to me, there is a lot of risk, or maybe you don't see it that way. <laughs> Somebody who doesn't calculate risk, and I think this is somewhat inherent in people who get involved in startups. You have a desire, vision, a motivation, 
And you don't factor in fear. You factor in the vision in your mind's eye, what you see. And in my case, I think I only really worry about this after it happens in terms of getting hurt. I never really feared the thought of going to space or what might happen during the process. I thought of the challenge, the adventure, the sense of accomplishment. And again, this is, I think, uh, very similar to those people that you've met in Silicon Valley who start companies like yourself. Uh, So maybe it doesn't compute for people like us. Uh, Maybe we just look at the vision, the goal, and, and we're willing to take that. And maybe if we do get hurt, well, then we figure out how to deal with it afterward. I think you actually had a better risk calculation than you just articulated. You mentioned that, that, hey, this is, you know, even though it sounds risky, there are what, 4,000 people working (laughs) for you to make, to de-risk it. Tell me more about it at this time. Yes, yes. Uh, Again, whenever you step into anything, you're doing some kind of a complex calculus and there are factors you know, and perhaps there are some factors you don't fully know, but through the calculus, you come out with a risk factor that you can live with. In my case, uh, as you alluded to, when I approached the opportunity to go to space, I looked at the fact that uh, this was an industry that is made up of people who are investing heavily behind it, whether it's uh, Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or even Richard Branson. And there are people who are really qualified engineers designing, planning for contingencies training, as in the case of uh, training us as astronauts. And through that process, you essentially make some kind of a mental calculation. And I kind of said this to friends of mine that sometimes in the past when I've sat on the tarmac at an airport and I see we're delayed for an hour while somebody's opening up some piece of the engine, I felt a lot less comfortable in those experiences than I did knowing that I had a company, in this case, Blue Origin, dedicated and making sure they hired the best people, had the best plan, engineering and contingency. So to some degree, I dismissed some aspect of the risk. And I think it's the same when you're starting a company. You're dealing with people who come to the company with a set of skills and invention capability. You put together a team of people that can execute and you de-risk the situation. So there are some parallels. So the way you look at it, it is not just the one person taking risk. It's actually 4,000 people taking a huge risk. In fact, there are 4,000 people taking a huge risk. They better work their ass off and then (laughs) making it work, right? So of course, it's not zero risk, but the risk is a lot less than just the one reckless person taking a risk. That's how you look at it. That's right. Look, in, in my mind, it's a lot less risky than stepping into an Uber ride when you don't know anything about the driver, you don't know the quality of his car, and you have one data point. I need to get from here to there, and this is the guy who picked me up. That's risk when I think of it. <laughs> right, right, right. In this case, right, you know, Uber probably has a 4,000 engineers working for you, right, riding this platform and then stitch passengers and a stranger uh, driver together. They better do a reasonable job. So it's not right. zero risk, but it's, it's a calculated risk. So that's actually very, very interesting. So you have done this Blue Origin in December. Do you want to go back again? Oh, there's no question. Anybody who goes through this experience, it's life-changing in many ways. Uh, Not only your perspective of life and our planet, the thrill that you've experienced something that so few people have been able to experience. And in my case, as has been documented, uh, being able to do this with my son. So, so many of these components of the experience give me great joy when I reflect upon it and, uh, you know, make me feel fortunate that in my lifetime, I would have the opportunity to experience this. For me personally, I've already started investigating other types of uh, industry-related space companies, technologies, experiences I might have. So yes, I would do it again, and I would encourage anybody to do it as well. You know, this is the first time ever, you know, father-son trip, and uh, you kind of uh, took your son over. Well, what happened? Like, how did you, like, uh, you just caught him one day, or like, uh, what, what, what happened? Anybody who's a parent 
thinks about the experiences they can have with their children. And that, that happens from youth all the way to the point in time which they move out, hopefully after a good college education. In this case, my career was my high focus area during a good portion of my children's youth. And at some level, I realized that I had not connected with my children uh, as much as I wanted to. And the reality is I actually offered all of my children if they wanted to go. It was only my son who raised his hand. Uh, so I was willing to take that that volunteer. But for me personally, there's not too many times you get to make up for lost time. And there's a lot of different ways you can try to make up for lost time. In my mind, doing something so powerful with my son was really going to be a memory, kind of a touchstone that we could uh, reflect upon the rest of our lives. And this was uh, one of those events that could achieve so much. And I feel blessed that we were able to do it together. And and I, I didn't at the time of bringing him think that there was something uh, so significant that we would be the first parent and child in space. But that was perhaps a cherry on top of the uh, Sunday. Yes, yes. So, you know, you kind of lost some time during the career building stage of your your lifetime. And then you feel like you, you made it up now that you, you and your son have a far better relationship. Yes, yes. And uh, it was really on multiple levels. Uh, we not only made up that time, but uh, as has been documented post the flight, my son affiliates himself with the LGBTQ community. And he was actually carrying a message for them and for me to be able to not only experience this bonding with my son, but also give him a platform was right. uh, also a gift to him at his age, being able to essentially be the youngest U.S. astronaut in history, but also carry a very special message. That was a gift to him, which also added to the bonding experience because so he took the chance so this is a life-changing part of the life-changing experience right for him uh can you tell me another aspect of the life-changing like you know you you mentioned the life-changing yes. a few times can you give me another example another thought about why this is a life-changing experience yeah and a lot of people call it the overview effect uh, people who travel to space i think so much of our time whether it's at work, in our personal lives, we're in the moment and we're dealing with issues that can cause stress, that can cause anger, uh, that can cause joy. And I think when you go to this kind of a, a level of looking at the planet from space, everything seems a little less significant on the more earthly front. You see the earth, you realize that the layer of protection that we have, which we call our atmosphere, is really so thin. It was incredible to me to think that in just over two minutes, we were beyond that thin atmosphere and in space. And then to look at the earth from space gives you a sense that it is so fragile, that life is fragile, that this planet is fragile. And you reflect more so, we see today so much of what's happening politically around the world. Most current is the Ukrainian crisis uh, with uh, Russia. And you see the challenges we have had with COVID. These are things that we deal with here on Earth. But in the course of history, in the course of this planet, when you look at it from space, you see peaceful, a peaceful planet. And you realize that this planet has been here for billions of years, may continue for billions of years beyond humankind on it. And that, to me, is something that I feel privileged to reflect upon. And it gives me a, a great sense of perspective in my day-to-day -day life today. Wow, this is actually very powerful. I would also add one other thing that I think is very important. Uh, the science that's going into traveling to space is really going to push our limits in terms of a lot of the technology we deliver and things that can perhaps even benefit the environment and long-term 
prosperity of the planet, the health of the planet. While I've been fortunate enough to have great success in technology, I see my success, and it was, as you well know, was in cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is to fix and protect the earth from something we humans have created. You know, we developed this technology, we developed these tools. But when we think about what we can create to save the planet, that's a bigger vision, a much more complex thing. And it's quite fortunate that people are willing to, I mean, private investment is willing to take the effort to invest in technologies that will help us explore space and long-term uh, planetary uh, safety. So there is one more thing I cannot uh, help asking because this is a lot of our podcast audience even asked, right? Sure. You know, w- what did you do for the training? Because, you know, in the past we say, hey, you know, to be astronauts, you have to go through rigorous training. And uh, for you, tell us, you know, because you, last time you and I talked, it sounds, you know, a little bit easier than I thought. Can you share with our audience about the training part? Yeah, I don't want to diminish the intensity of the experience, but for me and my son, it was astounding that the science was so straightforward in the what they call the flight profile uh, that these rockets take, that Mars, our training was primarily classroom training. We did go into simulation, but the simulation was inside a capsule where we would go through the motions of securing ourselves, belting ourselves into seats, listening to the sounds we would experience the entire time, understand when something might be wrong and what we would do if something went wrong and the impact it would have on us. But there was no physical training required. Biggest training, physical training that was required was me to exercise for two months to lose 20 pounds (laughs) to make weight. But, you know, People might imagine astronauts having wires to their chest and monitoring their heartbeats. That wasn't a requirement uh, for this type of a flight. It was just the understanding and expectations along each second of the flight. They broke the flight down for us, told us what we would expect at each point. Uh, We took quizzes, tests to see that we understood all the proper procedures. Literally quizzes. Wow. Yes. So other than the two months of the losing 20 pounds, like uh, how much time of the training for this launch? How many weeks or how many days? Believe it or not, it was uh, four days of training. Of course, I took advantage of some other things to prepare me. Uh, I uh, went on what the zero gravity flight. There's a, a company that offers a zero gravity experience, and I wanted to have an appreciation of that. But I did that on my own. Uh, Blue Origin had encouraged us if we wanted to experience that. Uh, beforehand to try it. But uh, it was uh, essentially, we arrived in Texas four days before the launch. Uh, They treated us with great hospitality. First day, we suited up and they tailored the suits. We had earpieces customized to be able to reduce and eliminate the uh, high decibel sounds that we would experience during the flight, uh, particularly the ignition of the engine and and some of the uh, other aspects of it. After the first day of uh, getting fitted for the suits and earpieces, we then went into classroom training for three days with uh, final tests. Well, we had tests each day, but final exam uh, at the end of the four days. So people might be astounded at the fact that it is that, quote, simple, But I think that's the purpose of this, because the goal by Blue Origin, as well as all of the other companies that are looking to offer civilian space travel, is to essentially make it achievable for the average person. Let's face it, uh, William Shatner went before me, and he's 90 years old. Yeah, that's true. So after trip, you actually went on to see Jeff Bezos' secret project. Do you mind to talk a little bit before we move on to other interesting topics? Well, I'll only speak briefly because it is indeed a secret project of his, and and uh, I'm sure it will be well documented and shared with uh, the broader public at some point. But Jeff is a, a visionary, and he is not bashful about the fact that he is 
privileged himself to have the resources to do things such as Blue Origin. Jeff has been in the process of trying to uh, create a timepiece that will chronicle time on Earth. And uh, this project is something that uh, he's uh, working on. And uh, I probably won't say much more about this, only because, again, we had the opportunity to travel with him to his team to take a look at this project. Uh, As I said, I think there will be more said about this. But I think the bigger part of this is that Jeff, uh, who I much admire, is somebody who is recognizes that private enterprise and uh, willingness to uh, go beyond the normal focus of investment and experimentation is something that he's willing to do, unapologetic to do it. So so I, I look forward to when he'll share more of the vision of this project with people and I'll probably leave it to that for now. Right. You know, building something that's going to be relevant for many, many years to come, not just for the current generation, right? You know, we have observed the Great Wall, you know, of China, a pyramid of Egypt, you know, things like that, you know, would be passed on to thousands of years from now. Sounds like he is doing something interesting, perhaps a digital transformation version of the Great Wall or That's right. Pyramid, well, I- but, you know. His vision is to leave something behind in many ways, similar to the great pyramids that we've experienced and uncovered that had great foresight from the ancient Egyptians. So Jeff's uh, project, uh, which uh, is a timepiece chronicling uh, mankind, is something that uh, will be uh, a gift that he'll leave behind to many, I think. Right. My last question on this space topic, you know, from the space. And then you see the Earth, obviously. Yes. And uh, anything recognizable from the space? Yeah, it's quite interesting. Uh, when you are flying on an airplane, maybe at thirty-six to 40,000 feet, you can see a small portion of the country or that you're flying over. And it's very hard to really identify because you don't know whether you're over one state or one country. You might see some recognizable uh, landmarks, rivers, exactly. Ocean. But, but in this case, uh, uh, at the height of our flight, we were able to see from California to Florida, essentially the entire continental U.S. So you can recognize California. Oh yes, yeah, because the Sierras, uh, the mountain ranges of California, and then you can see the blue of the ocean, and then to the other side, you can see what is uh, Florida and the Gulf Coast. So. Uh, you can really make this out. And it's interesting, uh, perhaps on this one day, it was a relatively clear day across the country. Ironically, there was uh, one set of disasters in the form of uh, tornadoes that had gone through a portion of the U.S. But when you look at the entire country, you really can distinguish uh, so much of it. The outline of the Gulf of Mexico to Texas, clearly see Florida, and of course, the uh, Arizona desert areas, canyons. So it was a lot to take in and somewhat surreal because, again, when you look at things from an airplane, you see just a very small part of the landscape beneath you. But to see such a broad amount of it was, in my mind, uh, amazing. That's the only way I could describe it. Yep. I have to say I'm jealous. (laughs) So now... Of course, you didn't get to this point by doing nothing, right? You know, it took, it's an amazing journey for you, you know, from career-wise, you know, very successful career, building in the high-tech companies, CEO in the recent years, you know, as an investor. You've done a tremendous amount of the interesting work. So let's just go back to your early days of the career, right? So if I were to say, hey, you know, there's one chapter you want to say, that's my defining chapter of my career. Which chapter would you talk about? Perhaps not any one chapter. A good book has a compilation of many chapters. But I think so much of the foundation for what made me successful actually began as a youth, uh, working for my grandfather and my uncle, 
at a very young age, I learned how to sell. And at the time, it was selling kitchen products. But the foundation of having the passion behind something and representing it and understanding there is a problem and you're selling a solution. These were foundational pieces that, of course, in my youth, I wouldn't have understood them to be so fundamental. But throughout my career, which led me to National Cash Register, following my college's, my college graduation, I once again found myself in the early days of a technology, in this case, PC based technology, which coincided about with the time I uh, graduated from college and found myself selling this technology. And it once again was no different than selling kitchen products as a youth. It, there was a problem and here was this new technology which had a solution. So there are these common threads that I experienced. I had the good fortune of, at the time, working in a large corporation. Uh, NCR Corporation, which was then acquired by AT&T. And I got to see how these solutions became part of a broader company goal or mission and how to scale a company and how large companies worked. So when you combine that set of selling go-to-market is probably the way I'd characterize this, the go-to-market experiences of my early career with the scalability of a large corporation, these became a nice combination of experiences that when I ultimately decided that I wanted to be a part of creating something uh, disruptive and innovative, I was able to take these skills and carry them forward to the companies that I had an opportunity to lead and uh, ultimately take into the public markets. So you started your kind of the salesperson journey when you were very young, and then you continued that in your career. What happened in terms of becoming the management, you know, or rising to the top of the management? What, what did it take? Well, I think that fundamentally, I was a quick learner. And this is not unique to me. I think it's a, a skill set that many successful people have. As we talked about during my conversation about the rocket, we're risk takers. We're not afraid uh, or feared getting hurt because we believe that there's always a way to fix what doesn't work right. And um, with this, really, I think it combined with the larger experience of working in a company to bring me to a point where I realized that this could be applied in so many different ways to work and build companies. Uh, in my case, I was fortunate enough, and maybe this was by, again, my quick learning and study of being able to select the right technologies, the right spaces, the right people, founders, inventors to come alongside. And I think generally that I believe that if you could find something that fit a need in the market, you can probably take that and build that into something significant. So this is probably maybe not so much of a revelation to many people, but the combination of being able to spot these opportunities, bring the right people and resources around them, understand the scaling necessity and capability of how to bring a company forward it's an interesting, uh, if I can use the term, cocktail of experiences that rarely do they all come together in such a perfect way. But in my case, I found that cocktail and applied it to the right set of companies. So that's a very good, right? Because you know you were a very good salesperson. And then you worked in the larger organization, right? You know, back in the days, AT&T was one of the best and the largest technology companies. You worked there. You kind of saw the top tier management. You learned that. And then you were able to put together uh, a lot of things together. But still, and then you kind of uh, rose uh, to the top at a... Uh, China Macro, which at the time was one of the largest cybersecurity companies. You were the executive vice president. But then, boom, right? You went to Palo Alto Networks. At that time, it was a startup, right? 
as far as I know, you didn't work for a startup before, right? In a big company, big shots. Now you go to a startup, even though you were the CEO, but how many people when you joined as a CEO? So what's your thought process? Because, you know, it's a lot of risk, but how did you think about the risk? Well, I will just add one important ingredient to this cocktail I spoke to before. I did actually do two startups before ending up at Trend Micro. And, uh, you know, I have to be humble in saying that they were not good outcomes and experiences, which, uh, again, I think adds to that component of quick learning and being able to correct. Um, okay, so even better, you, you had a two startup experience, both of them yes. didn't have good outcome. And then you were at a trend macro, a big company, and then you were the executive vice president. Yes. <laughs> and then boom, you go to your third startup. Why? Why bother? You were not scared off? <laughs> well, first of all, as we've talked already, I never had the fear, but it was kind of, uh, when as a youth, I played baseball and uh, the coach would say, you're up, you're at bat. It's your time at the plate. And I think Palo Alto really coincided with the level of experience and maturity. I went to Palo Alto as CEO when I was 46 years old. So already I had a, a very long career worth of experience, some 25 years of selling, uh, working in management, uh, having had good and bad startup experiences, having worked for large companies and understanding scale. So it was probably the best way to say it is it was my time. And so long as I put my skill set against the right opportunity, and this is an important point here. When I came to Palo Alto Networks, it was under the belief that I was ready to be a CEO. And of course, I hadn't been one yet, but I felt I was ready. I looked at a number of companies before taking the assignment at Palo Alto Networks. And through the process, I realized that my vetting process of selecting the right company, there could be, we all know that there are hundreds of companies in cyber. There are thousands, thousands of startups. Well, at that time, probably 500, and then now it's 3,000. Yeah. But I'd worked in the cyberspace at Trend Micro, as you recognized. I had all of these skills and an understanding, and I understood problem solution. Uh, so when I met with Palo Alto founders and the board, and the opportunity was described to me, quite frankly, it seemed almost as clear to me as it was when I was selling a mop to a housewife to clean up a mess on the floor. You have a mess, you get the right mop, you clean it up, and the job is done. Now, again, that's oversimplified when it comes to building technology such as a firewall. But to me, there was a need that needed to be filled. Uh, they had the right assembly of technology, engineers, know-how, experience from previous companies. I had the leadership as well as the management experience. And when you put them all together, it really gave me the opportunity to perform. And it wasn't an individual performance. Of course, it's about the team. It's about the collection of people. But that was my time at bat. So it's your time, no fear, 25 years experience, you know, you were ready for that, yeah. sure. But that was 2008, yeah. right? Middle yeah. of 2008. Of course, only a few months later, it's the financial crisis, yes. right? Yes. The sky was falling. What, what was in your mind, right? No fear whatsoever or tell me the truth? Well, I still didn't have fear. I think I was more fearful for the fear I saw around me. And again, not to be critical of the investors we had or others that believed that this was really the end of an era of venture capitalism in Silicon Valley. I just thought back to another experience I had, and it was one of those failed startups in the year 2002. As I shared with you, it wasn't my first rodeo. I happened to land in Silicon Valley in 2000 wanting to chase that dream of a startup. And it turned out that I landed in Silicon Valley right at the dot-com crash. So I actually went through that and uh, had to close down a startup. So, so the sky was falling, but it didn't register with you? Didn't register with the kind of uh, 
level of concern or fear, I went right back to what my fundamentals were. I know what failure looks like. I know what a bad economy downturn can be. I know how to build a company. I know this company has good technology. Let's press on. And so that was kind of the thoughts that I had. Now, that was a little bit juxtaposed to some of the investors and some of the sentiment in the market about what you do at the time of crisis uh, in an early stage company. But I'd actually say that my willpower, call it confidence, no fear, actually worked counter to the situation. For example, while so many companies were laying off some really great talent, whether it was engineering or sales or other management, we were pressing forward. So even though we were the small startup underdog, there was a tremendous amount of talent that was coming available in the market. And we had that privilege of picking some real great talent to to get the company where we needed it to be. We also had um, one of the things that's little known from the early days at Palo Alto, Flextronics, which was doing the manufacturing of the firewalls, had uh, all but shut down its uh, San Jose factory because Cisco and Juniper and the other larger competitors essentially were going to work down their inventories during this downturn. So because no one can sell anything. At exactly. This time. I was able to use this capacity that they needed to keep filled in Silicon Valley at the San Jose plant to negotiate tremendous manufacturing terms, uh, bringing the build of materials to these firewalls to a much lower rate than I as a startup could have done if those factories were at full capacity developing the larger company's uh, product. So we went counter to what people thought we should do. And it might, in fact, be, in that case, the thing that really made the company thrive during a downturn. So again, these are survivalist experiences that culminated from a lot of years of experience. I think, you know, the... <laughs> Flashtronics moment is almost like uh, Tesla did, right? Back in the days of the financial crisis, they acquired the factory from, I think, Toyota, right? So it's almost like the Tesla moment. So the company thrived because of the, the overall crisis, you know, the rest of the industry experienced. That's right. You, I think you were going to say it right. It's when you think different that you differentiate yourself. Right. You always have to, I mean, if you have to be successful, you have to think differently. So true. So Palo Alto Networks is a company, you know, I had a tremendous respect over the years, right? Because I've been in the cybersecurity industry for many years and uh, the company has been pretty successful, right? Uh, it's been least. very successful. Um, uh, and, and I feel proud to yeah. have been, you know, humbly, I'd say I was a small part of its success, maybe an important part in the early phase, but uh, certainly proud. Right. I always told, uh, you know, people in my own team at Zscaler today that, uh, look, you know, look at a Palo Alto Networks in the last decade. It's probably the most successful cybersecurity company, right? Independent cybersecurity company. And uh, anyone who, you know, came off Palo Alto Network would say, wow, this is a talent, right? And uh, at the same time, I, you know, I'm telling my own team members, say, hey, next 10 years, it's your time, right? Zscaler, yes. right? You know, X many years from now, people would say, hey, you came from Zscaler, right? And then this is the next generation company after Palo Alto Networks. So tell me more about it, right? So you were the CEO of Palo Alto Networks. And then, you know, in around, around the 2011, you joined Zscaler. Of course, today Zscaler is roughly a $40 billion company, depending on the day of the month. But at that time, no one or very few people understood it, right? I clearly remember I had a conversation with my own friends. They were the visionary in the cybersecurity world. And then we were talking about Zscaler. And then, you know, two of us suddenly didn't anticipate that Zscaler would be where it is today. So you joined a Zscaler. What kind of risk did you think you, you took? I didn't think about the risk aspect of Zscaler. First of all, because of the success at Palo Alto, 
I was well positioned to take any risk. And if you equate risk to, you know, financial stability, uh, I knew that Palo Alto was uh, on the verge of going public. But I will share that um, Zscaler filled an important gap in the product solution that I discussed early days with the product team at Palo Alto. So in some sense, it's recognizing that one company, one product doesn't solve all customer problems. And the vision, and again, I don't take credit for the vision that Jay Chowdhury had. The vision was a very bold vision. And it was, as people would characterize, predicting where the puck would go with regard to cloud development and the eventual evolution of a hardware-based a security infrastructure so to something that would be cloud native. And so um, I believed that that was a future. And this is, again, a perfect example of when like minds come together to solve a problem that have a very good set of complementary skills, Jay being an excellent product, uh, product marketing, product visionary, even pretty good in engineering standpoint as well in terms of understanding technology and me with the go to market the people management the uh, the scaling aspect and understanding of a company this was really a, a, a quite unique combination and since neither of us was uh, had a big ego about being the boss of course i respected him as the founder and ceo but he respected me as being somewhat of a, a partner in figuring out how to navigate through a very competitive, at that time, proxy market. It was a great combination. And it's no, you know, people will ask me, how do you do this? How do you pick two of the biggest, most impactful cyber companies right back to back? Again, I refer back to what we've discussed earlier. There's, there's an accumulation of experience that led to that. A first-time founder may not necessarily, you know, hit it that much right on the head of the nail. Uh, but in my case, it was 30-plus years by this time after Palo Alto. And I could see it again. And I see it in so many companies that I get involved with as an investor or as an advisor. So, you know, cyber is complex. So I think at the based on my observation of your own career, you took a lot of the risk along the way, but you know, based on your well, what you articulated today, it's a very much calculated risk. First of all, right, and secondly, or more importantly, I would say you don't see yourself take risks in those cases. The experiences were there; it's the right timing, right? You know, look at things from multiple dimensions, not just from one angle. It may be very risky, but you know, looking at things from multiple angles. And then looking at things holistically, so it's not so much a risk in the end, right? It's not a risk taking. Well, it is a risk taking, but you know, in your mind, it's a way more thoughtful risk taking. That's right, and I believe that I firmly believe now that that is a unique combination of skills and experiences that you know are somewhat uh, rare. I don't reflect too much upon my approach towards things because I don't think I'm that uh, arrogant or narcissistic. But, you know, when I step back from it, ponder on the, uh, how did I get here? What lessons can I share with others? And what coaching might I give to other founders, CEOs? You know, I realize that perhaps there is an accumulation here that is in fact a bit of a rare combination. And, uh, I like to teach and share. So see myself as the founder's best friend. <laughs> I may not be the guy who does it all, but I can certainly help people who have great visions. It's really a segue to the next topic we wanted to discuss. In the last few years, right? So you left the operational kind of the job. Now you have been an investor for the last, what, approximately seven years or so, right? That's correct. It's yeah. a very different ball game. <laughs> And uh, do you see making investment as, uh, again, a 
risk-taking business or you view it differently, right? As a matter of yes, fact, yes. right? You know, we are good friends because <laughs> you actually invested in Trustpath, the company I founded a few years back. And we started a, this relationship from there and then, you know, ever since then. So, but clearly when you invested in Trustpath, we had a PowerPoint. So from my point of view, you took a lot of risk. Hopefully it worked out for you, but you know, no matter what, if, you know, just the, in general, how do you look at a venture investing? Is that a risk taking, or maybe in your view, it's not so much a risk taking? Yes, well, it's a very interesting question because most people invest because they want to make money. I have to say that I don't invest because I want to make money anymore. I've done well enough that my investing really is to me my problem solving, my puzzle. A lot of people like to read a good book or do a good crossword puzzle. To me, my investing is the stimulation to me and my mind in terms of taking all of this experience and figuring out how I can do it again and help others do it again. For example, the selection of the companies that I've invested in. A simple lesson is stick to what you know. Most of the companies I've invested in, including your previous company, were in the cyberspace. I've done some investments that have been outside of that space, but my calculus might not be as sharp in doing so. So there's that process of selecting the company. And then there's the process of the product market fit, and that's very much understanding the company, the technology then there's the human aspect. So much of the success I've had has been because of the right founders, the right leaders, the right team, the right employees, the right culture. And if you see these things and they mirror or look similar to what you've experienced in the past in the most successful companies you've seen and be a part of, that's a good check mark. And then you go from there, then it's okay, how do we take this and how do we make this compelling? For the customer, it goes back to my early days of selling kitchen gadgets. We've got a solution. Do we have a real clear understanding of how it solves the problem that an enterprise, a company, or a consumer might have? So these are all, to me, fun puzzles to solve. And, and so investing to me, of course, the outcome might be a nice return on an investment, but I do it primarily as, I don't want to say my hobby, but my enjoyment. It's very different than venture investors who do this as a job. They have to perform at a certain level and they have to be prudent in the way they deploy limited partner capital. Of course, this is my own money when I invest and it's a lot simpler uh, situation in terms of dealing with partners and, and other people in, that uh uh, have a say in the decision. So I view it uh, not as a risk. And if it became risky, then I would probably, I think, depart from my normal way of doing things and perhaps just pass on it. Because in my mind, risk isn't fun. I just came back from a trip to New York City where uh, one of the earlier stage companies I invested in was having a live sales kickoff. I was so thrilled to see companies actually getting together live again. Of course, we need to be conscious of the health concerns uh, in the new environment of COVID, but to get in front of the team in this early stage once again and be able to participate um, to me is enjoyable to me in different ways than getting in a rocket and going to space. Do you think uh, financial rewarding is not necessarily the D goal, but has it been financial rewarding as well? There's no question about that. There's a few companies that I'm involved and invested in today that uh, may themselves become the next great cyber IPO. There are others that you know will likely be acquired. So there's certainly more money to be made in this stage of my career as an investor. But you know, the money that I might make as an investor may pale by comparison to the success in some of the previous companies I've, I've helped lead and take to the public markets. Nonetheless, it becomes more money for me to give to charity and philanthropic interests in the coming years. And that gives me great joy as well. 
Now, so as you said, right? You know, you the way you look at investment is different from the more professional kind of VC. But you work with a lot of VC, right? You know, you and I actually talked about a few companies together that you personally invested in early stage VC, right? The top tier uh, Silicon Valley VC. You also invested in some top tier PE, late stage growth stage. The investor, so I'm actually curious, right? Because you kind of invested in seed, you know, very early stage company yourself, and investing some of the big com- you know, growth stage company yourself, and you have so much visibility into early stage and growth stage investment. So can you share your your perspective in like the early stage investment versus the growth, the PE stage? Kind of the investment because you have money in both. How should people think about it? I've tried to understand where my focus should be and why it's there. For example, investing in early stage companies, there's a lot more risk, as we all know. The amount of work that has to go into an early stage to get it to some financial value is a lot longer road. The later stage, obviously, we know that it's a lot de-risked. What I've really kind of assessed is that I'm somewhat stage agnostic as much as I am captivated by the quality of the vision a company might have or the innovation or the disruption that that might create in the market. So if that is the dimension that I most look at, the disruptive potential, that could present itself in any phase. So for example, uh, if I'm privileged enough to be exposed to a cyber company, as we've talked about before in its early phase, and I understand the disruptive nature of that, I'll invest early. I'll take the four-year journey or whatever it takes for it to go from early stage to IPO. If I encounter a company that you know, is already well established, but yet the company has something that is going to be meaningful and impactful in terms of a market it might entry. And that to me is worthy of an investment. So I don't think so much in terms of the multiple of the return on my investment. And I think that's mostly because I'm unencumbered by the fact that I need to show a high return. You know, as we know, a lot of venture firms one of the metrics they might have is we need to find a company that has the potential of being a 10x for us to invest. I don't really think of it in terms of that. Um, There are many companies I've invested in late stage that might only bring a 3x return. And that's just quite fine with me. So I'm not focused on the ROI specifically. I'm focused on the disruptive and innovative aspect. That's what excites me the most. You know, you mentioned that, right? You know, ROI is not your number one metrics. And then you are not kind of uh, dragged down by the fact that other professional investors, you have to go back to the their limited partners every what quarter, every half a year to report their progress. The fact that you don't have that burden, do you think in the end, it helps you to actually potentially uh, have a more financially rewarding experience for that part, or you felt like you know that's orthogonal things. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, of course, I fully respect venture or private equity investors that have specific return targets. I mean, this is their business. You know, the fact that I don't really view my investments with that as the number one dimension, I think actually frees me to look at. A broader set of things. As we know, many venture firms will not look at something if it's past, say, an A or B stage because they want to do later stage tested, already tested, improving companies. And other firms, especially these days, seem to be taking a bit more risk and getting the early stage because they want to find that one gem. And they'll just focus much more on the factors that they believe will take that early stage company and and make the massive outcome. I feel privileged to not have that kind of measuring stick, or in many people might say that burden. And I think it actually has allowed me to listen better to founders or listen deeper to company value propositions, as we know. And again, I don't in any way disrespect investors that have to do this, but 
there's a simple checklist that, you know, in two or three early questions as they review a deck of a potential pitch deck, so to speak, they'll just turn on or turn off real quickly, but I'll go deeper. I'll listen longer. I'll think about what they might be missing or what skill set they may need to get there. And perhaps maybe I'm willing to take a little bit more risk. And again, it's the thread that goes through this whole talk today, Howie. Who gets on a rocket after only three launches and doesn't really you know, calculate or, or calculates through some complex calculus that this is worthy of doing? So I think it leaves me unencumbered. Now, I'm not going to say I'm the best investor and I get the greatest returns, but I will say one thing. I'm having a damn good time doing what I'm doing. That's super important. Hey, this is actually so good to have you talk about your, you know, space experience, your kind of the uh, Palo Alto Networks, Zscaler experience, and then, you know, most recently as an investor, right? You know, it's kind of a different chapters. And uh, before you and I talked, I was thinking, hey, you know, I know Lam for quite a few years. You know, I know him pretty well. One of my observations is, you know, he's a risk taker. But, you know, even though I thought I knew, <laughs> I know you a lot, but from this conversation, the, my takeaway is, you know, yes, maybe as a, from an outsider, Lam is a risk taker. But you, you actually took a very calculated risk. And then in, to a degree that it's actually not risky because, you know, whatever you do, uh, let's look at a recent experience. Yes, you do venture uh, investment at very early stage a lot of times. But most of the companies you invest is in cybersecurity, the space you know damn well, or at least you know how to right. sell uh, into cybersecurity um, space, probably better than 99.999% of the people out there. So it's risky, but you know, it's something you actually really, really know very well. So I thought that, you know, it's actually very thoughtful uh, risk taking, even though you are doing risky, so-called risky right. uh, venture investment. Well, it is interesting. I'll share with you, and I won't mention the specific company, but I'm the chairman of the board of a company, which I believe uh, will eventually be a public company uh, in cyber. And I put together as the chairman a board and reached out to some very capable executives. And in the early stage of this company, one of the board members, who is somebody I really respect a lot, said to me, Lane, what did you get me into here? This just doesn't make sense. And I said to this board member, you really need to trust me. There's this calculus I have, and I know that all of the things that are concerning you and don't seem to match up, they'll come in line. And I was really pleased, perhaps about uh, three weeks ago after we had a board meeting, this uh, board member called me up and said, damn, you called the shot right again. So tell me more about it. For this company, yeah. right, what did you see that others do not see? Well, again, since it was in cyber, I understood that there was this, a deficit in cyber. And again, I'll stay away from mentioning specific company names because I don't want this to be viewed as uh, me pumping the opportunity as a, as a future success. But the, in cyber, one thing is still has been lacking, and that has been the ability to predict and prevent. There is so much technology that can identify and remediate and address afterward. And so it was a gap. So I fundamentally saw that there was a product marketing opportunity that was being underserved, if not, not being served at all. There was a set of engineers and founders to this company that had a unique set of skills that I hadn't seen in any of the companies I'd been involved with to date, so that the product they had developed and the people they had assembled was a unique collection of individuals that, again, I felt could really deliver together. A relatively new CEO to be taking on an experience like this, and some might have perhaps uh, had concern over the CEO's experience, but I also saw within the individual tremendous capacity and commitment to the technology, the company, the people 
that I felt would uh, bring the level of maturity in his leadership. So just all of these calculations that if anybody took any one view of either the technology or the crowded market in, in, in cyber, the experience and success track record of the founder, on any one of those factors, you might have you know put up the red flag. But I could see beneath and lower to appreciate deeper the potential there. And, and again, I don't want to say that I'm unique in my capability of doing that, but maybe to some degree I am. And maybe that's why some of my outcomes have been better than most. Well, you know, when you are taking risk, you, you kind of have to have confidence in seeing something that other people don't see, right? In, in that particular case, with the technology, the people, the product, some investors may see a lot of brokenness of it, but you saw some pieces that just unique, the potential, and then jump into that opportunity and then it worked out for you. That's so great. So from that point of view, right, you know, we were talking about taking risk, but you were talking about, hey, this is actually more than taking risk. This is actually using my experience, right, looking at things from multiple dimensions, analyze it having my own insight, and then also be pretty selective, right? It's not like, you know, hey, just uh, <laughs> uh, spread your, your, your bets. You know, you still do, you know, very thoughtful thing. So it's actually so good to hear, right? You know, a lot of times when we do our own company, do our own investment, right? Don't think about just the risk taking. Yeah, sure, taking risk, be fearless. That's the important part. But also, what are the things in your mind to de-risk things, right? You know, when you take this Blue Origin, right? You know, in your mind, the 4,000 people, you know, working so hard to de-risk you, right? So that's a comforting thing. Same thing with entrepreneurs you kind of meet today. You know, the dedication, the commitment they have. And that's, you know, how important it is to you. I'm, I'm so glad to uh, have this risk-taking thing because, you know, originally I was trying to, you know, get your secret recipe about how do you look at the risk? But what I learned today is, you know, yes, it's about risk, but it's also about the non-risk part, right? And uh, we are not doing lottery. You know, your success, right? Multiple companies in a row, uh, those and then from operational side, from investment side, it's not a lottery. It's actually de-risked kind of the journey for you in many ways. Yeah, you say that you've kind of put that together well. And, and even through my own conversation today, I think you put a nice summary on that. Now, I just reemphasize one point you made uh, in, in the words you used before, no fear. I think so many people are encumbered in their life, let alone their careers, by, by fear, fear of an outcome, whether it's making a mistake at work and their boss giving them a downgrade uh, in terms of their performance, whether you as an investor are afraid of making a wrong call on a company and your partners in the investment firm diminishing in terms of their respect for you. When you have no fear and you're not encumbered by that and you can live with the decisions you make, and I, I think this is true about so many of the entrepreneurs I've worked with, they don't fear losing their job. They don't fear if their company fails because they have a certain set of skills and they'll go back and work for another company or they'll try another company. It's almost as if there's a certain part of their brain that never actually uh, was able to register the outcome, the negative outcome of fear. And if you're a child and you touch a hot stove, you learn that that's going to hurt. And you probably won't touch that stove again. I think a lot of people who go forward in technology companies and founding companies with no fear, they'll touch the stove. And if their hand gets burnt, they'll figure out how to wear a glove next time they touch the stove and, and not get burned. If they don't decide that they're never going to go near the stove again. Right, right, right. Just the one last question. You actually went to China, you know, a few years back, right? You know, after you came back from China, you actually give me this video, you know, wow, this is amazing. And I, we all know that, uh, you know, US, China has gone through a lot in the last few years. 
And then, you know, the uh, it's an interesting time, to say the least, yes. right? You know, not just the U.S., China, but also other parts of the world. For this podcast, we actually have quite some friends from China. Given that you had a you know, wonderful experience in China, you observed you know, a lot of the policies going on. Any thoughts, any words you wanted to share with you know, our audience uh, in China listening to you? I was so encouraged by the time that I visited China and other parts of the Far East uh, in the last three to five years. There is an innovative passion and appetite there not different, I should say, than what we see here in the United States. And I'm encouraged that there's talent that exists not only in the U.S., not only in Europe, but also uh, in the Far East and China. I'm hopeful, and this is where I, I have a little bit of concern. I won't say fear, because I believe in the end the right thing will happen. But I'm hopeful that the changes that we've seen in terms of the U.S.-China relationships, even leadership changes that have taken place in the recent year in China, don't upset the creativity, the passion for entrepreneurism that we've seen over the last decade uh, in China. And so I'm hopeful. And quite frankly, I would encourage people to continue to innovate because it doesn't matter where you're from. It begins with that passion for innovation, taking on challenges. And I think that spirit is alive and well in China and other parts of the Far East. That's so true. And you still believe the right thing will happen. I do. I That's do. the typical I, lame you know, um, being optimistic. That's great to I, hear I just from always you. hoping they happen sooner than later. <laughs> yes, hopefully sooner than later. Hey, Len, thank you for your time, You're right? Welcome. You know, this, uh, you know, you have not just been my investor uh, from my trespass day, you know, not just my great investor, but also good friend. And uh, most importantly, in the last few years, a great mentor from all aspects. You know, a lot of the people actually also came to me these days about, hey, you know, I wanted to grow my career. I wanted to do entrepreneurship. And uh, I thought I wanted to have, you know, have a conversation with someone so that people can actually uh, learn a lot, get a lot. And uh, you are the best person I can think of for this kind of the talk about, you know, the innovation, about the entrepreneurship, about the growth. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for allowing me the opportunity to, to share with others. I, I really appreciate it. Thank you. This is What's Next, Science早知道就到这里了。听完之后，如果你有任何的想法，欢迎在评论区里面给我们留言。我们每一条都会认真的看。如果你喜欢我们的节目，请记得给我们五星或者好评，分享给更多的朋友，也会对我们非常有帮助。你也可以单独写邮件给我，邮箱地址是听 t i n g at 声点 f m， 我都会一一回复。那同时，公众号和微博也可以搜索“生动活泼”，声是声音的声。节目相关的更多信息会在公众号里出现，微博和公众号都会有不定期的福利给到大家。如果你想要跟我们更加紧密的讨论和分享，或者是想要认识和你一样有求知欲的新朋友，可以加入我们的微信群。进入听众群的方法是在公众号文章中扫码添加，或者是公众号后台回复“科技早知道”即可获取邀请码。期待你的加入，我们下期见。